Welcome to the Bethel Church Sermon of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message by Pastor Bill Johnson. For more information about this podcast and other resources, visit Bethel.com. What an amazing opportunity to see the goodness of the Lord. I, I've, had a, I've had an interesting um, couple of weeks just personally, ex- experientially with the Lord. and, and uh, um, so, so let me just get to it. I really don't have a teaching. I have uh, an exhortation, an invitation, a something. I don't, e- don't even know what to call it. Uh, probably 10 days ago, I, I uh, joined a school of ministry out here under the tent. And uh, we had a, it was a wonderful time of worship, but something started to happen um, that maybe had started previous to that, but I became uh, unusually aware, <clears throat> aware of, uh, of the glory of the Lord that began to fill that tent. I could feel it tangibly. I've had these um, experiences uh, throughout, uh, throughout my own personal journey. I remember uh, when I pastored in Weaverville, um, I, would, uh, I would take uh, time often just to walk through the sanctuary back and forth. When nobody was there, I would uh, just, just, just to worship, just to pray. I remember there was a little piano there, and I would sit and play a bit and just, uh, just do whatever I could to give him the best offering I could give him. I remember times where the presence of the Lord became so overwhelming to me that I I'm embarrassed to say it now, but I quickly thought of something else to do. I, I, I quickly thought of things. That, it, that doesn't mean when things come to mind, it's necessarily the enemy. Sometimes the Lord brings things to mind that we need to take care of, but it wasn't that. It was the, the intensity of presence was so, was so strong that I found myself just getting nervous, just getting a, a little bit anxious. And, uh, and I didn't recognize it immediately. It was, it was later. I started to see that there's a, there's a measure of presence where, where all of us, that all of us delight in and a measure of presence that takes us into great, great discomfort. Um, which is fine, because he's the comforter. So my opinion is uh, he makes you uncomfortable so that you need the comfort. And, uh, and he's, he's pretty good at that. There was a story with Moses where he, um, he could go no further until he had done what the Lord had commanded him to do. And in that case, it's to circumcise his kids, his sons. Um, he had gone to this distance, and then suddenly what was a normal journey became life and death. And I, I, I don't mean to suggest life and death decisions, although I, I do think they exist for us. Um, instead, I, I, I want to emphasize that we're on this relational journey, and there just come there there come there comes to us points in time where He has an agenda, and mine won't do. I mean, you can have you, you know if you've been in this a while, probably for all of us or you know 95 percent of the people that would be watching, every agenda you have, every agenda you have has been shaped by Scripture. It's, it's, not like, it's not like wanting revival is an evil desire. It's not. It's just in the glory, all my agendas, all my ambitions, all my dreams, as lofty as they are, they all have to take place, uh, another place outside of this glory. Because in this glory, there's only one thing that matters, and that's the face-to-face with this one I, I'm not there as a pastor. I'm not there as a speaker or a writer or whatever else you blank you'd fill in. I'm not there as that. All those hats are left outside the door. There, there's only one hat. It's the hat of a son. It's the only one that works in there. And um, I've had this sense for quite a while, but it, it, it's becoming more uh, tangible in the, the last, uh, especially the last ten days where in, in that, <laughs> in that uh, tent, in that time with students, I started to, 
to rediscover something that hadn't been lost. That would be wrong, but there was a, there's always a freshness to his presence that makes, it almost makes you feel like you've never had it before. It's so fresh, you know. There's always something so new with what he's saying and doing. It almost feels like it's the first time you've ever heard him speak. And yet, outside of that experience, you can see the history that brought you here. But in that moment, it's like, it's like, it's like hearing, <laughs> hearing for the first time. I, I, it reminded me of something. Oh goodness, it'd be 2010, 2011, somewhere near Eric. My son was, was leading the second uh, year school of ministry. And there was, a, there was about a five month period, I don't remember the year, but there was about a five month period. Uh, they met over at uh, our Twinview campus, our, our second campus. And they were, the, the school, uh, the second year school was there and I don't remember how many students there were, I, I would guess 300 maybe. But anyway, uh, that room was, you know, packed and Eric was leading and, and as one of the pastors, I have a, a time slot where I, I go over there and, and speak and it's always a, an incredible privilege to, to do so. I remember I would walk in, there was, this, there was this five month period of time where I'd walk in, it was like walking into a cloud. I mean, it was, it was, it was like walking into a cloud that's alive. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't fog, it was walking into this, to life itself on a level that was so wonderful and so overwhelming. I remember I would come in and in the back, I would, I would come sit down. Sometimes I'd make it to the front. I'd come and I'd sit down and Eric would be there. And, and listen, this wasn't led by you know, a great worship time, those were there, and that's important. We just had a wonderful time now. And that kind of uh, uh, instrument that the Lord uses is very significant and important, but, but this was different. It was, it was almost like the Holy Spirit, the choir director of heaven entered the room and, and he, was, he was conducting something. Wow. I remember sitting down next to Eric and he would look up at me and say, what do you want to do? I said, I'm not touching this. I, I have absolutely nothing to say. There are times in the glory where that's what you do. There's a word, there's a word of the Lord. It's the ultimate moment. I mean, you want those moments. So I, I don't want to suggest at all that somehow when that, that manifest presence of Jesus comes in that measure that we, that we don't speak and somehow teaching goes out the window. I, I don't believe that. And, and I've seen the opposite happen. I've seen those moments that are so overwhelmingly pregnant and filled with God himself in the room. And then there's a word. And, and I, I believe that. But this wasn't, this wasn't that season. It was it was five months of coming into a room where, where it, it just didn't matter. <laughs> strange, strange to say you could have this burden or this vision or this desire or whatever to preach this or to pray for this or to do whatever, but somehow, somehow in this, in this living cloud of presence, Oh goodness, it, it just doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. And I, I remember during that period of time, I don't even know how many times I actually spoke. <laughs> I did a few times, but it wasn't very often. It wasn't very often, but I sure encountered Jesus a lot. Yeah. I sure encountered the love of God, even through people. There was su such an unusual interaction in those times, you know, you don't, Jesus said, I gave them my glory that they may be one. There's something, there's something about the glory that just makes everybody fit together perfectly. It's, it's not through striving, it's not through effort, it's not through determination, it's in the glory it fits. And, and the reason is, is that's what we were designed for. I was designed. Everything about me, every, everything about me that's of him was, de, was designed to fit seamlessly in the glory, seamlessly. I'm actually wired, and 
Oh, you are too. Every, every born again believer, we're actually, we're actually wired to recognize him and to respond to him. And part of that response is obedience. Obedience is the most natural thing in the world in the presence. You know, if you can imagine Isaiah 6, where Isaiah says, I see the Lord, he's high, lifted up, train fills the temple. It's overwhelming. This overwhelming baptism of presence where he sees the throne of God. <laughs> and then he hears God say, not to him, but in conversation in heaven, who will I send? See, there, there's something about in the glory. The glory is, is not just to absorb and walk away blessed. It's to be impacted by so that we impact everything around us. And, yeah. And the Lord asked this question. He said, who will I send? And Isaiah says, I'll go. I, I can always tell when people are truly in the glory because they want to serve. Yeah. Now you can want to serve without being in the glory, but when you do, the heart of God is what launches you. It's not, uh, it's not my ministry goals that matter. It's, it's not, you know, it's not me fighting to see my gift expressed or appreciated or whatever. All that stuff just dies. It just dies. It's so unimportant in that moment. It's embarrassing to discuss because in that moment, all you know is I hear a heartbeat and that heartbeat has become my heartbeat and something has shifted and changed, at least in this moment, how I see life. And I, re I remember, I remember that that five month period of time as though it was yesterday because it has become yesterday. 10 days or so ago in the tent with the students last Sunday night was the same kind of a, same kind of a moment in the tent. I don't know, maybe we're just built for tents. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, I don't know, maybe we should just do the big old revival tent and get it over with, you know. There's, I don't know, there's some, I don't know what it is. I, I don't understand it at all, but I know that last Sunday night I experienced it again. It was, he, was, he was there, and that's all, you know, that's what the glory is, is it's the manifest presence of Jesus. He was just there. You say, well, he's here, he's with me now. That's true, I, I, I get that. But there are so many dimensions of his presence that, that no matter what you're experiencing, there's more. And the key to more is stewarding what you've been given. It doesn't matter if it's money, anointing, gifting, doesn't matter, friends, friends, doesn't matter what it is. The key to increase is always stewarding what you have well. And there are, there have been times in my life where, as I stated earlier, that, that presence, that glory would come so strong in that little sanctuary up up in the mountains that uh, I would just become nervous and find something else to do. And so I don't say this in shame, embarrassment. I'm just saying this is reality. There's no increase in that moment. I found my limit. And so somehow coming into that place of presence again and again and again with whatever in me needs to yield so that there can be more. I can't describe it, but that's the journey. You see, he's got us on one track. There's, he has one ambition, basic, you know, I mean, there's a lot of dreams for us. I don't want to make it overly simple, but there's this statement in Haggai chapter two. I, I will never forget when I first read this as a pastor. <laughs> in Weaverville, it just leapt at me. It's, it's Haggai chapter two, which is one of the small little guys. He's, uh, it's kind of hard to find him. If you get to Matthew, just turn left. If you get to Daniel, turn right, he's in there. But he, he's, he says several things here that I think would be worth uh, noting, and then I want to talk to you a bit about where we're headed, where, where where we're headed according to him. Verse five, according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. The presence of the Lord makes fear illegal. The presence of the Lord 
is a partnership with a foreign spirit. For thus says the Lord, verse six, once more, it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea, the dry land, I will shake all the nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations. My translation highlights this phrase in this way, desire, referring to Jesus as the desire of the nations. And I I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. And here's our phrase, the glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former. If God is in charge, there's always an increase of glory. If we are, we just build monuments to what has happened in the past. We build them in our theology, we build them in our experience, we build them in our routines, our disciplines. They all shout to the past. But there's something that is always expanding in the presence. It's this, it's this intangible thing called the, the glory of God that is always deepening and always, I don't know, I don't think we ever arrived, to be honest with you. I, I've got a feeling that heaven is, uh, is going to be one continuous journey deeper into the glory and there is no limit, there's not an end. It's not like, okay, Father says that's all there is, sorry. We'll have to exist the next hundred billion years just with what you got. It's just this unending journey into the presence, into the glory. Ephesians 2 talks about the riches of his grace, which is one of the expressions of glory. And in that phrase in Ephesians 2, he says that in the ages to come, we would discover the surpassing riches of his grace. Ages to come. The billions of years ahead of time off in eternity, in those ages, there would be the continuous unveiling of yet a deeper level of this mystery called grace. And that mystery of grace always introduces us to glory. We find different stories in scripture that uh, that they, they rock me. Uh, I'm assuming they do you as well. Second Chronicles chapter five is one of them. It's this amazing uh, moment in the dedication of the temple. Solomon had, uh, well, let me back up. David, his dad, had discerned that there was a shift, actually there was a shift in worship, but more specifically, David perceived a reality that existed in heaven that was not discovered in the law. It was not revealed in the law. And David started to realize in his relationship with the Lord that the Lord wasn't interested in the blood of bulls and goats. It doesn't mean it didn't count. It was important for that season, but it had its, it had its limits. It had its its measure of impact, it, it, wasn't the, it wasn't where God's people were going to land was on the sacrifice of animals. That's not the landing point. That was the illustration that got them ready for the real lamb of God that once and for all settled the issue. But David somehow discovered this in his journey with the Lord and the prophets, Nathan and Gad, confirmed what he was picking up, it says in Chronicles later. He picked up this shift in, in worship and, and that the Lord was actually looking for the sacrifice of the heart, the contrite heart, the yieldedness, the fruit of the lips that gives thanks or praise to his name. The Lord was actually looking for, for people to put themselves on the altar as an offering to him. And it's not because he's an egotist that needs our affirmation, he's quite secure. He's, he's, he doesn't need anything. I hear people say, well, he, he, he needs our love. He doesn't need our love. He doesn't need anything. He's, he's very self-sufficient. Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, they make a real good team. They don't need anything, but they desire many things. They desire many things. They desire my heart. They desire it. For it adds something to them that nothing else and everything that they have made could add. And he desires yours. And it's that wonderful, that beautiful expression of just turning our, our, our attention, our affection towards him. See, the war that's been going on over this last year with the pandemic and all the other stuff, is, it's a war for attention because the enemy wants to dilute your affection. It's always t- 
to divert attention to defile affection. And there's something about this, this reconnection with presence that is, is home. It's just home. It's, it's home. It's like everything else is where I'm visiting. This is actually home. I'm set out from home. I get to do all this stuff, but this is home. This seamless connection with this manifest presence of Jesus, the seamless connection between my surrendered heart and his heart for me is just the most beautiful thing. And so when Solomon becomes king, he builds a temple. We, many are familiar with the story. It's a, it's a truly, truly wonderful story. But he built it with the materials that David set aside for him. You know, Solomon's given the credit for this extravagant building, but it was David's wealth that built it. He set the stuff aside. It was this father-son thing. It was like the only time I can find in history um, where, if I can call this revival, what David was experiencing, where a revival increased in the next generation for Solomon. Now, Solomon didn't sustain it, tragically, or everything would be different, but he didn't. But for a, for a brief season, there was an acceleration. And where they learned the value, the beauty of ministering directly to the Lord, not just for the Lord. And, and, you know, they had to still do the blood sacrifice because there had to be that point of obedience that they never lost sight of, that sin is only dealt with through blood. It had to be established in their thinking. And yet here's the rub. The blood of bulls and goats can't deal with it. It only postpones the penalty for one more year. And so there's this constant reminder, they need the Lamb of God. They need that. The law was given as a tutor, a teacher, an instructor, that, that would lead them to Christ. And so all of this is a part of that journey. But throughout this journey, they got to taste moments of grace. Grace was not just introduced in the New, in the New Testament. Grace is seen all through the Old Testament. There's just moments there's just moments where there's no other explanation, but God just has mercy on Abraham and considers him righteous because he believed. That's grace. That's grace. And actually, that story became a New Testament model. It became the prototype for every New Testament believer. It happened in the Old Testament. It happened before the law. It's extraordinary what takes place through all these moments where there's just this, like, just little windows that open to let, let us see what grace looks like. Another one I, I'm thinking of is when, when there was this in Nehemiah's day where he, uh, in, in Nehemiah 8, they, they found the scriptures again. They hadn't had it for a generation or more. And, and so they're, they're standing in the open square and every, everybody's there. I mean, everybody, kids, babies, infants, everybody is there and they're all standing at attention as the word is read. And this, there's, this, there's this overwhelming conviction that comes on the people because they see God's standard is here as the word is read that they've not heard probably in their entire lifetime. God's standard is here and their lifestyle is down here, and they begin to weep and to mourn because they didn't qualify. And the priest ran among the people, said, stop mourning, this day is holy. Now, I don't know how you grew up, but I grew up thinking mourning and holy were synonymous. You know, the, the more you wept, the more you were able to illustrate how holy the moment was. And, and it, was, it, was, it was actually the tears of mourning in that moment defiled the holiness of God. And so the priest ran among the people and they said, stop it, stop it. Send portions to those who have nothing. Grab your food, grab the meat, grab the wine, grab all these things that you have in a family feast. Get them together and start rejoicing because you understood the words. That's stunning. God's standards here, my, my lifestyle is here. And God says, the time to rejoice is when you understand. That changes everything. You actually rejoice your way into maturity. Hmm. Sounds like a child. Most of us need to grow down instead of grow up. So here we are in this moment. Fast forward to Solomon's day. He builds this temple and it's time to dedicate this, I'm going to assume, 
the most extravagant building that's ever existed. Man, I would love to see it. And so here's this moment where the priests have come together, and I remind you, uh, Exodus 19, verse um, 6, and Isaiah 61, verse 7, announce to the people of God, you shall be priests under the Lord. 2 Peter 2, verse 9 says, you are priests unto the Lord. Old Testament pointed to the future, said it's, hap- it's going to happen. Peter and the book of Revelation, chapter 1, I think it's verse 5, announce it's not coming, it is now. You have the right and responsibility to minister directly to him. So everything we see of that nature, of that, of that, uh, that function in, in the Old Testament is, is to seed the clouds, is to give us insight. And so here we have, um, we have all these priests gathered together. And um, we have uh, um, verse 12, let's just start there. It says, the Levites who were singing, all those of Asaph and Haman and Jeduthun with their sons, with their brethren, stood at the east end of the altar, clothed in white linen. They had to wear linen, they couldn't wear wool, because if they wore wool, they would sweat. And there was nothing you could do on your own works, sweat in the presence of God. Everything was to be by grace. So here's another glimpse. You're never there by your works. And that was, that was the insistence of the Lord. They had cymbals, stringed instruments, harps, and with them 120 priests sounding trumpets. Man, that had to be something. I mean, there were entire family lines. Their whole job was just to play trumpets. And if you think about it, it almost seems silly. A whole other family line, they were singers. A whole other group, they were just cymbal players. The whole point was they had to become excellent at what they were doing and they were to carry on that mantle throughout their family line. Awesome. 120 priests sounding trumpets. Verse 13, it came to pass when the trumpeters, the singers were as one to make one sound. Yeah, but I want to stand out. No, you don't. No, no, you don't. You're privileged to be a part of the whole. It's not about you. It's not about me. When they were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord, when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever, that the house, the house of the Lord, was filled with a cloud so that the priest could not continue ministering because the cloud for the glory of the Lord had filled the house. What did we read in Haggai? The glory of the latter house will be filled, will be greater than the former. It's always his intent to take us from glory to glory. Anything less is man's influence. It's always his intent to take us from glory to glory doesn't come because it's my goal. It comes because I surrender to his. So here in this moment, we find, I don't know how many are there. There's at least 120 that are there that are playing trumpets. Then you've got probably the same amount or more that are singers. You've got the cymbals, you've got string discs, you've got all this stuff. So you've got this massive, massive crowd and they're all playing, not for the nation of Israel. They are playing for the audience of one. We're playing to him directly, to him. Every strum, every clanging cymbal, every every syllable that is lifted up in song, everything is for the one. And when that happened, and it, it became a united sound, when they sang as one with horns, that's a miracle right there. When all of that comes together as one sound, The cloud, the cloud came and so filled the temple. Nobody had to stand up and say, I think it'd be appropriate if we went to our knees right now just to honor the Lord. I I believe those moments are fine. I've done it and probably will do it again. Who knows? Day's not over. But it wasn't that kind of a moment. It was an involuntary, I've got to hide my face from the one who just entered the room. Here's the deal. This all happened under an inferior covenant. 
and inferior covenants do not release superior blessings. If what happens in this context happened in the Old Testament, when they were just learning what it was to sing to the Lord and to honor him and to give offerings of thanksgiving and praise, if if it would happen in that environment, then how much more has he not designed it to happen here with us? I remember a prophetic song we had in Weaverville. Prophetic songs were uh, the song of the Lord, where the Lord himself is, is singing. I mean, I didn't hear his voice, but we, we heard through another voice. I remember the word. He said, did I not fill the tabernacle of Moses with my glory? Did I not fill the temple of Solomon with my glory? How much more should I fill the place that I build with my own hands? My beloved, I'm building you. No matter what we throw into the mix, our ambitions for our families, our countries, our cities, or whatever, just put it all in the pile. It is all profoundly impacted by the glory. Where is this thing headed? I I can't shake the fact that his goal is for the whole earth to be filled with his glory. Now he's God, he can make that happen now, but it'd be a military invasion, it wouldn't be through partnership. See, his longing is always to accomplish the significant things through co-laboring, through the yieldedness of his people. Those who've been made in his image, created in his image, would respond with likeness, with the same heart as he has, to model, to illustrate, to release, to activate his will in the earth. And that's the heart of God. That's the heart of God. That's the privilege that we have in this hour. We, we know his heart. I may be confused by a thousand things, but the one thing that's not confusing, not if I read this, the one thing that's not confusing is he has got me on a track. It's not a road where I can take directions I want. It's a railroad track. You don't turn. The direction has been set. You can stop. You can go backwards, but you can't change the assigned direction. The direction is from glory to glory. From glory to glory. So I remember I've been uh, sentimentally (laughs) stirred up in the last week or so, just in my own private little world, remembering. I'll never forget the Sunday sitting right down there where Brian, my son, was, happened to be leading in worship that Sunday. He may have played two chords. I've always said it was one, but it might have been, he might have gone to a second chord. But something happened on that second chord where he filled the room and we didn't get to our first song for 40 minutes. Awesome. And no one was keeping track. It was after a fact. You look back. Why? Because... Some, something happens when he comes in, everything that was important to you, you can't even remember. It's not like, ah, oh, I'll bring it up later. No, it, you can't remember it. In, in the manifest presence of the king of glory, suddenly there's only one thing on your mind. It's what I was born for. I, I was born for this seamless interaction between the king of glory who has made me qualified because I could never qualify myself. He's qualified me to be here in this moment. And it's in those moments we hear him say, who shall I send? And without even thinking, the hand goes up. People who tell me I love to worship the Lord, I I don't like to, I don't like to leave that place. I'm not sure they saw him yet. I'm not sure they actually saw him. Because I'm not sure he could see his heart and not want to go. I, I don't know if it's possible to sit in that moment where you, where you see him, where, where there's the overwhelming sense of who he is and what he's like. And then he says, who shall I send? And you find your hand going up and said, I'll, I'll do it. You name it, I'll do it. I'm there. I don't know what I'm doing. But I trust you'll go with me. I'll go. 
I, I, I'm not sure that anybody who wants to just sit there and, and do nothing has actually seen what they claim to have seen. There's, there's something about who shall I send? I'll go. There's something about that moment of going where that glory never leaves you. It's not like I'm departing the glory. It's like I'm, I'm going to now enter into a greater realm of glory because I will now be an instrument in his hand. And perhaps that is how the whole earth becomes filled with his glory. As people in the presence carry the presence to bring change. I believe, you know, I, I teach a lot on fulfilled dreams and, you know, the desires that we have. I believe they're meaningful to God. I, I do all, all that. I haven't changed my tune at all. But I, I have been strangely apprehended again for something that's way bigger than us. I love us, but this one's bigger than us. This one's bigger than us. I remember that one Sunday morning where Brian hit, I think it was the second chord, and, and he just, I don't know how to describe it. You know, it's afterwards. In the moment, you don't know what to do. You know, afterwards, you look back and go, man, he just walked into the room. And that was that kind of a moment. I'll, I'll never forget that. We, we've only had that happen on that level one time in 25 years. But I, I remember a Sunday night where the worship team was playing, and there another one of those moments where the glory just came in and everybody up here just stopped and everybody out here just stopped. And it was almost like we were suspended in time. You know, you know how people get nervous when nothing's happening, you know, like somebody, especially in Pentecostal circles, somebody need to pray in tongues or prophesy or laugh or get out and dance or do something. You know, it's like we, we get nervous with blank spaces. There was no nervousness with that blank space because he filled the blank space. He, he, he just came into the blank space and all of a sudden, you didn't have to tell people, turn your affection to him. It's just, there was just silence. I don't remember ever hearing silence for that long in a, in a crowd that likes to make noise. It was like the ultimate offering was just to shut up, but yet nobody said or suggested. It was just, it's what you do when he enters the room. You find everything that you could think of to say is completely meaningless. And I'm hungry for that again. I've had tastes in the last 10 days or so at levels, measures that I've not had for a while. And it tells me that we're being set up and it's gonna be good but it won't be about you and it won't be about me. He has set something in motion and he wants us to see that he was absolutely serious when he said it. The glory of the latter house will be greater than the former. The context was there were people that saw the temple before it was destroyed and then rebuilt. And they remember both. And the first one with Solomon was just incredibly glorious. And the second one wasn't near as beautiful. And so you had, you had two groups of people there. Some were laughing for joy because look, the temple's built and others were weeping. Man, it's nothing like it used to be. And so that prophecy was very, very specific. In, in other words, this thing that you see over here, that's not it. I'm going to do something in the earth that is going to be way more glorious than even Solomon's temple, which silenced and stunned the leaders of nations. God will do it again in his house. And that's you and that's me. I feel like there's an, an invitation. I, I wasn't sure how to, how to label this talk, this conversation with you today, but uh, to me, I, I can't talk about it without feeling invited, without feeling compelled.
uh, dissatisfaction is a holy, holy gift. See, sometimes our satisfaction in the absence of revival is what prohibits revival. Is that I'm actually okay without it. Sometimes the absence of the manifest presence of the King of glory Sometimes my satisfaction in those moments may be the very thing that propels that glory. So here's, here's an invitation. I'd like for everybody watching to, to join me in this very, very simple prayer. God, I can't make myself suitable but I can surrender. And there are people right now watching, you don't even have a personal relationship with with the Lord Jesus Christ, and this is the most unusual message ever to invite you into the family, but I'm gonna do it anyway. In this moment, you have this sense, some of you in your homes, there's going to be this sense of presence you've never seen before, you've never felt before, you've never realized before, but it's happening now. I had that sense early this morning that there would be this, encounters with the Lord himself in your home. I love the corporate gathering, but there's, see, it was in my one-on-one stuff that helped me to realize the corporate stuff. So wherever you're at, some of you have never surrendered to Jesus. I want you to just to simply pray this prayer in, in, in the online chat room, tell somebody what you've done. But it's just praying this prayer, God, I give you my entire life that you would be glorified. Do in me whatever pleases you, that your name would be exalted. Do in my family, in my home, that which delights your heart. See, the scripture says, the Lord speaks at one point, he says, for I'm not ashamed to be called their God. I would like everybody watching this to have the Lord shout over your actual home, the physical home that you live in. I would love to see the Lord of glory stand over your household and shout to everything that exists, I am not ashamed to be called their God. There's something about to be released in the earth. And it's through surrendered people. So Father, we pray right now, I ask that you would use this overwhelming sense of presence and that you disciple us this way. You teach us this way, that we would never be satisfied with anything less than you again. Like Moses, we want to say, if you're not taking us, we don't want to go up from here. We don't want to go just blessed. We don't want to go just with favor and open doors. If you're not going, if your presence isn't that which makes us different than everyone else, then we don't want to go anywhere. So I'm praying that. I'm praying that for us, us, this tribe, this family, the Bethel family all over the world. Mark us with the glory. God, I invite you, interrupt our dream time. Teach us what you're like. Teach us. Open up new pathways of discernment and perception in our physical body, our hearts, our minds, that we just expand our ability to recognize you, the glorious one. And that somehow that would be the contagious factor, not a pandemic, not a virus, but a contagious factor called the glory of God. The glory of God has become known in the earth. That's what we want. So I invite you to do that with us as a family. And I give you thanks. Thanks for listening to the Sermon of the Week. This weekly podcast can be heard in multiple languages on our Bethel TV website. If you'd like to partner with us in discipling nations and fueling personal revival, you have the opportunity to give at Bethel.tv slash podcast slash donate. Hello, hello, hello. I miss us. My goodness gracious. This is like the longest fast ever. This this is like, this is worse than fasting food. Fasting hugs, it should be illegal. In fact, I'm through fasting hugs, so... 
if, if, if that bothers you, stay away from me because I will grab you and hug you. So all of our online family, uh, I know we've got uh, folks gathering in homes right now all over the Reading area, which is just the coolest thing ever. So glad to hear that. And then uh, our international community, we're just, we're glad, we're just glad. Glad to be able to call you friends, glad to be able to call you family. Um, I, I, I know that when um, there's like a pandemic, I mean, this is, it's serious, it's a real disease, and I don't want to ever make light of that, but I do try to find things to laugh at in the middle of everything. And so if that is annoying to you, plug your ears, do something, go la, 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 while I read to you a few funny things. Chris put this on his, I'll blame him, he put this on his Instagram page. I used to spin the toilet paper roll like I was on the wheel of fortune. Now I turn it like I'm cracking a safe. (laughs) That's a good word right there. Yes, it is. I think the coronavirus is turning me into a dog. I'm roaming around the house all day looking for food, told no every time I get too close to a stranger, and I get really excited about going for car rides. (laughs) Oh, goodness. I love this one, too. I ate 11 times today and took five naps, and it's still today. (laughs) Okay. Um... Thoughts and prayers go out to all the married men who spent months telling their wives, I'll do that when I have time. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's, uh, let's get started. How are we doing for time? We're doing good. Um, I want you to open, uh, open your Bibles, please, to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. It's a very familiar passage, which I'm thankful for. There are just some portions of Scripture that should stand out more than others because there seem to be things that the Lord is really breathing on. And, and I feel it so strong on this passage right now um, in ways that uh, are really hard for me to describe. I've been looking forward to today. I've, I, uh, uh, it's been an unusually uh, busy season for us as a staff. Um, you would think with this slowdown, it, there would actually be a slowdown, but I didn't notice it if it came. It, it, uh, it went past me. Um, it's been an unusually busy time, but thankfully, uh, Benny and I were able to take some uh, vacation time uh, this month, and that was just real wonderful. Uh, the letdown, of course, is not being with you, but I, uh, we, we did have uh, some wonderful time to rest and, and uh, just enjoy being home, so we're, we're glad for that. Um, for, uh, for the last several weeks, I, I don't know exactly how long, but for the last at least two weeks, maybe three or four, I've been waking up morning after morning often, not every morning, but morning after morning, sometimes in the middle of the night, quoting this verse. You know, sometimes you find divine moments because you, 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 you're saying something that you didn't come from here. It, didn't come, it, was, it wasn't a premeditated statement. It was just something that came up from here, just that volcanic eruption and I have been finding this happen to me over and over again in recent weeks. <clears throat> and it's this passage, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. We'll read the whole verse, and then I'm going to take you through it, and we're going to talk about it. Verse 14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Let's read it again. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. For probably 40 years or so of my life, this has been a... um, a standout passage. I remember uh, as, a, as a young man attending conferences uh, at Jack Hayford's church in Van Nuys, California. I remember one in particular where the entire event was about prayer and intercession. And speakers would speak and oftentimes this passage would be used as, as a real driving force to bring healing to the land, to bring healing to 
100 plus nations represented by our viewing audience, but specifically for the state of California, for the nation, the United States, that we bear a responsibility for. And it's not only in the heart of God, it's in the history of God to bring healing when there has been great devastation, when there's been great uh, disaster, uh, morally, uh, naturally, natural disasters, that sort of thing, uh, wars, whatever. Uh, the Lord has a habit of bringing healing and bringing restoration and, and, uh, and doing a work that only he could do. And, uh, but it is, it is instigated by the people that he shared his name with. So he says, if my people, it's not, it's, it's funny to me sometimes that as Christians, we get angry for unbelievers acting like unbelievers. <clears throat> and I, <laughs> I'm not sure where to go with that, but just I'll leave that where it is. Um, the Lord puts the weight of responsibility for transformation on the shoulder of his own people. He didn't say, when the nations turn to me. He didn't say, when those who are, uh, struggle with addictions, when they get free. He didn't say, when the marriages are healed. He didn't, he didn't say any of that stuff. He just said, if my people, the ones that I gave my name to, think about that for a minute. The ones I gave my name to, it's extraordinary because Jesus said, he said, you will ask the Father in my name. You're going to use my, my name. You'll ask the Father in my name and anything you ask for will be done for you. Then he says, wherever two or three of you are gathered in my name, I'm there in the midst. Then he says, wherever two or three of you agree as to touching anything in my name, it shall be done for you. So the, the weight of, of responsibility for transformational expressions of God rests on the shoulders of those to whom he has given his name. I'm giving you a name, now use it to bring change. I've given you my name. One of the most beautiful things that has happened in this strange season, these four months, has been we've been reduced to our point of strength, which is the two or three gathering in his name, as many of you are doing in homes. The family unit, the two or three gathered in his name. The government of heaven rests upon the shoulders of the two or three gathered in his name. There's responsibility. We are not here taking up space, keeping busy until we die or Jesus returns. We are here with a transformational assignment on earth as it is in heaven. And please notice that that expression is linked to a prayer that we pray because we've been given his name. If my people who are called by my name, I believe that the most important ministry of all ministries is prayer. Worship and prayer is the premier assignment that we've been given. I'm personally thankful that in, uh, in recent weeks, the Lord's been refreshing me in what used to be a much greater strength than it has been in the busyness of recent years. No excuse whatsoever. But there is a strength being restored to my own soul. Uh, the place of prayer. It's from our knees that we have the greatest effect on the world around us. It's from our knees, it's from our place of prayer, of intercession, that we become actual partners with God. God's not looking for people who know how to stay busy. He's looking for people who know how to represent his heart. And I'm not going to represent in action what I've not found in prayer. 
It's the connection with the heart of God that gives me the authority to represent him with absolute confidence in action. Prayer without action is incomplete. In the same way that faith without works is dead. We've been called to a lifestyle of prayer. And I hope and pray that everyone listening, everybody who uh, is here uh, can feel the, the, that particular stream deepening in your own soul. As I, I believe the Lord is, is, is to, to be honest, is trying to get us to repent our way back into a place of righteous influence that God has called us to. And that is from the place of prayer. He says, if my people, the ones I gave my name to, will humble themselves. Chris, one of the first words we had in the beginning of this unusual season, uh, Chris brought, and, and he made a statement, I think it was something like this, the way forward. Humility is the way forward. Humility is the way forward. Perfect and timely word. Humility is the way forward at a time when it's easy to be hurt and offended and angry and zealous and withdraw and do all the stupid things that we as humans know how to do, um, humility is the way forward. And so the Lord said, if my people, the ones that I gave my name to, those are the ones who have actual responsibility. I think it was John Wesley who said um, that God does nothing in the affairs of man except in response to prayer. That's something that I have actually believed and tried to live aware of is that statement for the last 40 some years is that God looks for partnership. Without him, we can't. Without us, he won't. Is another statement that I've heard through the years. Without him, we can't. Without us, he won't. And so that place of prayer is a place of coming into a place of agreement with the heart and the mind of God to exercise his authority in the earth so that his will is done here as it is in heaven. There is the prayer, there it is the, the contract, the, the, the request that is made. Um, I, I, Ed Sov also made a statement uh, this, a couple weeks ago that it really moved me. He said the, something like this, the key to answer, answers to prayer, he says 98% of answers to prayer is from abiding in Christ. It's living in the conscious presence of the Almighty God. That is the strength of the answers to prayer. It's the two or three gathered in my name, I'm there. So the whole issue of the breakthroughs in the earth come out of living in that awareness, that awareness of the presence of God with me and upon me to make a difference in the world around me. That is the connection for answers to prayer. And so he says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and pray. It's foolish to be given such a transformational tool such as prayer and not use it. It's foolish to face an impossible situation. Everybody knows how to lift up a panic prayer. I'm not opposed to that. I'm glad he sometimes answers those. But transformational praying is more like giving birth. Paul actually talked about that. He used the, he used the concept of giving birth to illustrate prayer. He's, he was referring to one of his associates and he said, he is praying, he is laboring in prayer. The word labor, as physical labor of a woman, laboring in prayer until Christ is formed in you was the phrase he used. It's a, it's a different kind of a praying. It's, it's, it's digging in. I know the heart of God. I know the will of God. And I know there's opposition. I don't know necessarily what the problem is. I just know I have nothing better to do with my life than to abide in him until the presence of God, his own faith becomes my faith. And I learn in prayer to petition God, but also to represent him as I make decrees to standing opposition. I 
I understand something like 25, 26% of Christians vote. That's insane. The moral cesspool that has grown in many of the nations of the world watching this broadcast, that moral cesspool has developed and grown on our watch. And the lamest excuse invented by the devil himself is that I only have one vote, my vote doesn't really matter. Devil made that one up to disengage the most powerful, influential people on the planet. Because there's no such thing as an act of obedience that is powerless. There's no such thing. There's no such, I don't care if you're taking a sandwich out of your grocery store to the homeless man in front of the store. It is an act of obedience that releases presence and power. I don't care if it's the phone call to your neighbor that you haven't seen and you heard that they were sick and you're finding out what's happening. Every act of obedience of a believer releases presence and power. The glory becomes manifest in the atmosphere of obedience. The simplest act of physical obedience. And the thought that I could do something responsible for my nation and vote for my city and to be powerless is an absolute insult to the power of the gospel that he has given us his name. He's given us his name. A single act of obedience to the Lord. Just do your best. Pray, vote values, not personalities, and let's see if we can make a difference. I know he's not talking about voting in here, but I am. <laughs> it's, it's honestly our responsibility is to pray. You know, there's a lot of people moan and groan. They call it intercession. And but do nothing outside of that to make a difference in their own culture. And, we, and we've been called to make a difference. It's our responsibility to make a difference. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. The face of God is what we are invited to pursue. Think about that for a minute. Because the scripture gives that warning, anyone who sees his face dies. So it's a great invitation. (laughs) Come and die. And I tell you what, every time we come before the face of the Lord, something dies that shouldn't have been alive. The Lord invites us into this ongoing interaction with the countenance of a perfect father. So when he says, seek my face, he's not saying seek my hand. I, I've, I've, uh, I have tried to make a strong point for the last probably 20 years that Jesus never scolded anyone for seeking his hand. Blind Bartimaeus wanted to see. Jesus didn't say, oh, you're supposed to seek to know me. He, didn't, he gave him healing in his eyes. You know, the one with the dead relative. They, you know, Jesus brought through his hands the power of God to establish kingdom. He's never scolded anyone for seeking his hand, his blessing. I think it's a responsibility we have. But forgiveness doesn't come from his hand. It comes from his face. It's from the countenance. It's the Father who welcomes. And that's what's needed right now is a group of people that get recalibrated to the face. Somehow, seeing the eyes of a loving father recalibrates every value in my soul. Things that were important 10 minutes ago are no longer important. Things that plagued me or worried me or frustrated me, suddenly they don't have the bite that they once had. Why? Because there's something about the countenance that just absorbs every offense or distraction that I carry in my heart. It just gets absorbed in this face of a loving father. And he says, if my people, the ones I gave my name to, if they would just humble themselves. Seek 
seek my face. Turn from their wicked ways. There is a picture given Old and New Testament that to seek the face of God automatically implies turning from something. I must turn from the inferior to seek the face of God. You, you can't drag both values into one act. He is the all or nothing God. He is the, he, 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 is, he likes being first <laughs> and king. I mean, he, he's, that's him. Every, everything is about putting him first. So here he says, seek my face, turn from your wicked ways. In Hebrews 6, it says, turning from dead works, faith towards God. It's this turning from unto. And one of the things that I'm so thankful for about the Lord is he welcomes us into his presence regardless of the condition of our heart. You can be bitter, you can be mad, you can be indifferent, you can be you know, careless. It doesn't matter where you're at. He says, come, but you can't leave the same way you came. That's, that's the whole deal. You can't, you, you can't expect, I'm gonna bring all this baggage and I'm gonna come in and then I'm gonna leave the same way. That's not how it works. We come in before him and we just get refined in the journey. That's part of the whole process is that I come to seek his face and things get recalibrated in this, in this journey. It may be a five minute journey. It may be an all day long journey, but it's this journey where I engage once again to the face of God that reveals the heart of God that automatically engages me into my reason for being. He said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek the countenance of this wonderful father. I've been reading the last couple of days, again, Psalm 67, which is personally a favorite of mine. And, uh, and, Verse one and two of, of that great psalm. Verse one says, Lord, bless me, which I love that prayer. I'm, I'm into that kind of praying anytime. Bless me and cause your countenance to shine upon me. Countenance is a word for favor. It's the loving favor of a father. It's, it's the, uh, uh, Brian and Jen just adopted another little boy. And, uh, and we, uh, we got to have him at our home again last night. And, and it's just, you, you don't have, you know, a, a parent will make faces to an infant that they would never even make in the mirror to themselves while they were alone. I mean, you say things, you make noises, you do all kinds of stuff to this little tiny infant that, that you don't even know you're doing. It just seems to come out of you as you, as you and I've been told that children are actually, infants are trained in a lifestyle of joy through the countenance of their caregiver. And so it's that face. And so here we are, we seek the face of the almighty God, this perfect father who welcomes us, welcomes us. We come with baggage, we leave clean and powerful. We come with issues, we leave confident. He is settling the issues. And he says, you seek my face, you turn from your wicked ways, then I will hear. That's an amazing statement because the Bible tells us he doesn't always hear. I don't know if you know that or not, but the Bible says, scripture says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. If I come conscious of sin and I'm unwilling to repent. So here he welcomes us. He says, turn from your wicked way. Seek my face. Then I will hear from heaven. Forgive their sin. This is amazing to me. Forgive their sin. Personal blessing. And heal their land. Corporate influence. The personal breakthrough becomes a transformational influence in the land. <clears throat> 
Sometimes I think uh, people avoid times of prayer because they think it will take hours. And, you know, sometimes I've been in moments of prayer where you just lose track of time. Those are glorious, glorious moments. But history has been shaped by people who prayed simple prayers, but they were all in. All in. The history of our nation, we're celebrating Independence uh, Weekend. History of our nation has been shaped by the prayers of a general in an army where it looked like they would certainly lose. And they just took the knee and they prayed a simple prayer and everything changed. Simple prayer. A president, a governor, different ones who just simply take the knee and pray, acknowledge the almighty God. This is something that we have the privilege of doing throughout the day. It's not just the two hour block of time. It's the five minutes of surrender here. It's the 10 minutes of praise and exalting him there. It's, it's that riddle throughout my day. I never want to escape the fact I carry his name and I carry it for a reason. I am here to make a difference. And in the abiding presence of God, I've been finding that, that the prayer meeting never stops. It never stops. It started while I was sleeping. I found myself praying. If my people who are called by my name, I would wake up praying that prayer. I'd get up in the morning. I would grab my Bible, sit out on my deck. It would continue. It would continue throughout the day. It just, it doesn't stop because the abiding presence of the Almighty God is upon me as a testimony to me that you're here, son, to make a difference. Learn to pray out of abiding. Learn to pray out of the presence. Learn to touch, to tap into the heart of God. Express that in prayer and decree. And let's do what we're supposed to do. Make a difference in the earth. This is what we are assigned to do. This is who we are. We're people that have been given his name. This will seem very elementary to you as it is. But this next statement is one that I think is forgotten often. And it's this. We battle not against flesh and blood. We battle not against flesh and blood. That's not our problem. And to fight effectively in the war we were born into requires a strength that is found only on our knees. It's only on our knees. I'm going to assume that you've been experiencing this as I have. I would have been embarrassed to admit it, but it feels like more and more I am being delivered from the prayer life that wants to convince God of doing what I want him to do. I never would have thought that, that it would ever be a desire of mine, but I can tell sometimes that the frustration in prayer comes from that. 
And the whole issue about effective prayer is it begins in surrender. It's not that great things aren't supposed to happen. We're designed to make a difference in the course of history. We're shaped for that. I made a statement here some years ago that you can't find your significance until you have found your insignificance. And sometimes it's just that place of going low and surrender where you, where you, you are not confident of your strength. I don't need self-confidence. I need God confidence. And I, and I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to speak bad about being self-confident, but I've had it. It's disappointing. <laughs> it's disappointing. Self-confidence is no greater than self. And it's very unimpressive. Prayer is engaging with the unlimited strength and the unlimited heart of compassion of a perfect father. It's that countenance of a father that says, son, now, now pray this. Now do this. Now call this person. Now give this away. Now do that. It's, it's that it comes, out of, it comes out of this, the countenance of a father who can guide you with his eyes. He looks at you in a certain way and you, you just know this is, this is now my responsibility. It's, it's the abandonment to the heart of God. It's the abandonment to the will of God. Then suddenly we find ourselves praying simplest prayers that move heaven and earth because they come out of abiding. They come out of surrender. They come out of the acknowledgement that God is with me. God is with me. Not just as a theological statement. I sense the might, the beauty, the wonder of the almighty God who is now resting upon me because he has assigned me to do something. I remind you, Jesus stood in Luke 4 before he had done any miracles. And he said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. And then he declared why. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me. And then he announced why. It wasn't arrogance. See, in abiding presence, in abiding presence, there is courage to declare truth regardless of what it sounds like to somebody else. It's not permission to be offensive. It's just the spirit of the Lord God is upon me to open the eyes of the blind, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he had not done any of those things. I'd like to suggest to you that in that abiding presence comes the God confidence we were all designed for. The God confidence that that can look at a situation and say, no, that will not be happening on my shift. No, no, that will not be happening. That disease, no. We draw the line, no further, no. The destruction of that family line, no. That ends today. It's not a careless prayer. It's something that comes from the abiding presence of digging your heels in saying, I know the heart of God. I know the mind of God, and I know why I am here. I am here with a purpose, and it is to bring an end to that. That, that will no longer happen. I want you to stand. If you would, I'm going to wrap this up. I know I've got more time left, but I'm going to end it in a moment anyway. All of you that are at home, you can stand if you want. Those of you in your car, I like how you said it earlier, don't stand. If you're in your car, don't stand, please. I, I, I was about to say, I feel like commissioning for prayer taking place, but it's different than a commissioning. It's an invitation. It's a summons. It's a summons. 
Come into the courts of the king. I gave you my name for a reason. Come into the courts of the king. Learn to recognize my countenance. Pick up my heartbeat because it's in that abiding partnership my purposes are accomplished in the earth. Father, I pray that you would increase that that global sense of summons, the summoning from a perfect father to come and to pray and to make a difference in the earth. I'm asking for everybody in this room, everybody watching online, give us the grace for this season to not fight against flesh and blood. To not mistake people for the enemy. Give us the redemptive touch, the eyes of a perfect father, the loving heart of a father. Help us to represent you well. I want to end with this. I know that anytime we have as many people as we have gathered on Bethel TV, YouTube, the various forms, formats, there's always a high probability that there are people watching that don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. You don't know what it is to truly be forgiven by God and welcomed into his family. I want to say this is your moment. Now is the moment. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, there's no other name. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. Wherever you are, in fact, if you're watching on Bethel TV or YouTube, any of those formats, please, you can uh, write right now on your comment and and, uh, get the help of a pastor, one of our team that will pray with you. I pray for that right now, that there will be transformation of people's lives all over the world through this beautiful and wonderful gospel. Amen. Now, how many of you say amen to the invitation to not fight with flesh and blood, but instead abide and see answers? Amen, amen, amen. amen. All right, bless you, thank you. Thank you.